right, so we will be going over chapter four, theories of knowledge. So as we delve into this learning process, it, based upon a multidisciplinary approach, there's gonna be six different disciplines within the approach um, that we're gonna be looking at to help us in understanding knowledge. Those being philosophy, semiotics, linguistics, artificial intelligence, psychology, as well as anthropology. So philosophy, this is the oldest paradigm and this searches for the meaning or the essence of who we are. How do we look at reality? You are currently trying to earn your doctorate and it's not in psychology. You're not trying to get a side D like mine, but rather you're trying to get a PhD, which is in philosophy. Here, your quest is going to be learning how to decipher, to be able to dig and to find the answers that revolves around knowledge around what's considered to be real. Each of us possess our own reality and because an individual's views of the world will be different based upon his or her experiences. So for some, the answers may come clear as day, whereas there are gonna be others that may not be able to uh, be too sure of what's real and what's not. Imagine a person that have mental illness like with schizophrenia. Their reality will be based upon experiences that's going to span through with uh, periods of psychotic episodes. We might not believe it exists because we understand the concepts of the symptomologies of delusions and hallucinations, but for that person experiencing it, it's real to them. So we have to understand that there is going to be impressions that can have a lasting effect on one's perceptions of the world. There's one term you want to know that uh, Martinez discussed and that's the geocentric view of the world. And more or less this is things where it's going to be widely and commonly accepted based on what I actually would say is a confirmation bias. And what do I mean by confirmation bias? I'm talking about when many people say something is real, then it's a chain reaction in which everyone else begins to believe that concept. So enough of that, but let's look at now, when we talk about realism, what is real? Ontology, that's a branch of philosophy that's gonna be centrally concerned with that nature of reality or our sense of being. Ontologists wants to be able to understand what is real in the universe. They wanna look at that big picture is there a higher power? Are we the only ones in the universe? Or was there something real about Area 51? This particular area in, in philosophy is considered to be a foundational type of construct in, your, in the attempts of our acquiring knowledge. Now, Martinez looks at some of the big, big names in philosophy those strong philosophical viewpoints that has lasted in this, over the centuries. So the first one being to talk about is Plato's Allegory of the Cave. Now here, this is that part of uh, philosophy that's looking in ontology and how it talks about uh, experiences that's being directly impacted by our senses as well as what would be considered an ultimate reality and not necessarily the two being the same. Plato, he made a point of looking into a story in which he actually, not looking into a story, he created a situation in which he had prisoners go inside a cave. And pretty much in that cave, they uh, couldn't look outside the cave. They had to always look at a wall. And during that time when they're looking at the wall, Fires were built and they used all type of figures, animals, shapes to cast these different shadows on the wall. So this is what people, the prisoners, all they got to look at was these different shadows and shapes and the stories behind them. And the prisoners, they can only make out those shapes and started believing them to be reality. So 
if that's all that they've seen, that's all that they know, right? Now, one of the things that was pointed out in terms of the allegory of the cave is when one of the prisoners was set free and they were allowed to go back out into the world. And unfortunately, due to being in nothing but a dark cave for such a long period of time, the, the sunlight was like too much for them. And it tempor tempor temporarily blinded them where they couldn't be able to see. It's like, think about when you first wake up, one of the things I always hate is if I've been sitting in the dark for a while and then somebody just flick on the light with our fair warning, it's like, oh gosh well imagine this to the tenth power now this prisoner had to try to examine reality and it became too overwhelming and too painful because they really were blinded and couldn't see so as he became more accustomed to the light then he saw that there was a little bit more than what the shadows was being projected against the wall of the cave However, for the longest, that's what he only believed in. That was his, you know, his sense of reality. And he was torn from that reality and thrown into the new world again and expected to understand a new reality, which was quite difficult. All right, so second thing we need to look at, epipesial. <laughs> I'm having trouble with my pronunciations. Upper physiology, and if I said it wrong, laugh, have fun, I don't care at this point. You know what I mean. <laughs> anyway, this is that area in philosophy that's dealing with how we understand what knowledge is and how we know we have it. They're concerned with a number of different tasks that might be handled, like uh, being able to sort two different type of categories. The first one being the nature of knowledge. What does it mean for us to say that I know something or I don't know something? This is really that matter of understanding what knowledge is and how to be able to distinguish between different scenarios in which someone may know something, different ish, um, uh, situations in which you don't know something. While there's a general agreement about some of the aspects to the issue, we have to also look at how the question would be much more difficult than one could truly imagine. I probably shared already, if I didn't, uh, my time during internship, I had what we call the superwoman complex. I was trying to do everything and anything because deep down I actually feared uh, had a, a, the feeling of an imposter type of complex. Not sure I really knew what I was supposed to know. So, in essence, I overshot myself in attempts to demonstrate to myself, you do know this. Instead of trusting me, I doubted myself. But, questions will always pop up in our mind of how much we truly know about a particular area, a particular type of construct or context, the things that we learned, have we truly learned it? I hear questions from students all the time saying, I don't know if I really have what it takes. I don't think I've learned anything. And that was one of my biggest complaints during grad school. I complained all the time about this information you're giving me, I'm not learning anything. But then when I got out in the real world and after I got through internship and started trusting myself, I realized I did keep more in my head than I realized. But getting back to the topic at can, the second thing we have to consider is the extent of human knowledge. And that's how much we're able to do or can we even know how much to do. How can we use our level of reasoning, our senses, uh, the testimony or experiences of others, as well as our resource to, resources to be able to acquire knowledge in itself? Are there limits to what we can know or learn? For example, are there some things that you can't learn or is in terms unknowable? <laughs> 
is it possible that we don't even know nearly as much as we think we do? So should we be have a legitimate worry like I had? Should I be so skeptical about my abilities? Again, doubt will creep within your mind because the view we'll have is we do not or we cannot know everything, but we can try. Moving on, let's talk about Plato and Aristotle. Now, these two were philosophers in ancient Greece uh, who critically studied matters of ethics, science, politics, and a whole lot more. Though many more of uh, Plato's works actually survived through the centuries, it's actually Aristotle's work and contributions that were probably more influential um, because his views landed more towards science as well as logical reasoning. Now, while both philosophers' works are considered uh, less theoretical valuable in modern times, they still have a great historic value. Plato, he believed that concepts had a universal form, an ideal form, which kind of led to his idealistic sense of philosophy. Whereas Aristotle, he believed more in those universal forms were not necessarily going to be attached to each object or concept, and that each instance of an object or concept had to be analyzed on its own. That viewpoint led to uh, Aristotle's empiricism, whereas and, and it's the big basis of what we do in psychology today. Whereas with Plato, the thought experiments and reasoning would really be enough to prove a concept or establish qualities of an object, but Aristotle dismissed that in favor of saying it's more about that direct observation and experiences that we need to contend with. Kind of see where the philosophical viewpoint for behaviorism might have stemmed from. Anyway, logically speaking, Plato was more inclined to use inductive reasoning, whereas Aristotle used deductive reasoning. So, <clears throat> Both Aristotle and Plato, they, they believed that the thoughts were superior to one's senses. However, whereas Plato believed the senses could fool a person used through illusions, Aristotle stated that those senses were needed in order for us to be able to determine what is real, what is reality. So an example of this difference in allegory of the cave, that was created by Plato. And to him, the world was more like that cave. A person would only be able to see shadows that's cast from the outside light. So only reality would be those thoughts based upon those shadows. Whereas Aristotle's method is more obvious solution is to be able to walk out that cave and experience what the uh, cast and light and shadows did directly rather than just rely on indirect or internal experiences. Now, this picture that you see, the background picture you see on this slide, is <clears throat> the School of Athens, and it's a depiction of what philosophy is. And those figures in the middle uh, represent, um, the figures all together, rather, represents, you know, what's being held as a master, so to speak, of a true philosophic debate, that being they're talking about and discussing astronomy, geometry, arithmetic, uh, and it's all depicted within a concrete form. These arbiters, uh, they're talking about the rules, and of course, in the middle are Plato and Aristotle. <clears throat> and pretty much, they're in the center, and they're engaged with this dialogue. Now, Raphael's School of Athens kind of illustrates how uh, everyone's seen Plato's and Aristotle's viewpoints. Plato is believing in the more non-material world views. He holds his hands upward, whereas Aristotle is going to be pointing downward, demonstrating that he's more grounded and he needs more of the touchable or noticeable type of uh, issue objects to be able to guide his beliefs, which is, of course, within the field more of logic and science.